Happy holidays, everyone. The worlds of FromSoft's modern catalog, from Demon Souls to Elden Ring, are incredibly rich in environmental storytelling. So much so that it can take the community years to fully uncover their details. Over these years, we here at Tarnished Archaeology Incorporated have made a few observations ourselves, some of which we haven't seen discussed amongst the community. Today we thought we'd celebrate the holidays with you all and share our favorite bits of environmental and real-world storytelling, each an independent observation that may or may not make it into our future episodes, but that we thought were interesting in their own right. Rest assured, we have plenty more secrets to reveal in their own dedicated episodes to come in 2023. So, without much further ado, please enjoy this potpourri holiday special episode of Tarnished Archaeology, the top 10 FromSoft environmental and real-world lore secrets. Number 1. In Elden Ring, the art of smithing is said to originate with the fire giants, according to the description of the hammer weapon. But did you ever notice that all throughout the mountaintops of the giants, there is a strange orange coloration to the rocks? This is, of course, a deliberate attempt by the developers to display iron ore, which looks exactly like these rocks do. As we've alluded to in previous videos, much use of precious metals was initially sourced from meteorites, because the iron found in iron ore was low grade and unworkable. The extraction of sufficiently high grade iron from iron ore through smelting at high temperatures was a massive technological advancement for humanity, basically the genesis of the Iron Age and the widespread use of iron smith tools. So the giants were the originators of smithing because they had access to rich stores of iron ore and had high enough heat through their sacred flame to smelt it and forge iron tools. It just goes to show you that even when it comes to the color of the rocks, FromSoft are paying attention to the details. Number two. Speaking of giant smiths, have you ever wondered why the access point to the forge of the giants is a giant chain? It certainly seems odd that it would have been constructed that way. Well, the answer may come from taking a closer look at the forge itself, which closely resembles a mobile blacksmith's forge, something that actually exists in real life. Consistent with this, two of the three chains are actually dangling down from the sides. Only one has been made into a bridge. So it seems the chains, rather than being used as bridges, were actually initially used to suspend the forge. It goes without saying that whatever was large enough to carry this absolutely massive structure must have been a true giant, much larger than the ones we see in-game. Most likely, the Giant's Forge was actually built by what we will call the Ancient Giants, the race of predecessors to the Giants who you can see embedded into the rock in the mountaintops and in Caelid. They are clearly much, much larger than the modern-day Giants, so it's plausible that they could have originally built the Hanging Forge. Only as their successors became smaller and smaller did it become stationary, and the suspending chains became bridges. Number 3. This one confused us for quite a long time. In Bloodborne's Yarnum Metropolis, all throughout the sprawling city, we can see a curious mark on the trees. Why do all the trees show this same mark? It's a puzzling, consistent feature of the trees that seems unnecessary and yet deliberate. If you look closely, it even appears as if the tree has been damaged, not painted, again, quite odd. To put it simply, a piece of bark has apparently been stripped from all of these trees, and herein lies the solution. This is where cork comes from. The inhabitants of Yarnum, so all consumed with the production of that special Yarnum blood and their famous blood cocktails, needed a source of cork for the innumerable bottles they were producing. So they turned to the trees within the city itself. It's a minor detail for sure, but one that bugged us for quite a while. Mystery solved. Number 4. 
In Dark Souls 3, Rosaria's finger invaders collect evidence of a kill by cutting off the tongue of their victim. I'm sure you've noticed these severed pale tongues are curiously wrapped with a bloodied piece of linen cloth at their base. If you've ever tried to pull someone's tongue out through their mouth, you know that it is impossible to hold on without something giving you a good grip. We here at Tarnished Archaeology do not condone the cutting off of human tongues, so we'd suggest just googling it instead. A coarse strip of linen is just the right tool for hanging on to a slippery tongue. In fact, it is exactly how cow's tongue was prepared, traditionally. When designing pale tongue trophies, the developers went through the motions of how a tongue would be collected, gripped by a piece of linen, and severed from the victim's mouth. The blood gushing out of the tongue would soak the linen, and the tongue itself would pale. No stone left unturned from Miyazaki and company, evidently. Number 5. Staying with Dark Souls 3, have you ever noticed the strange relief that decorates the sandstone walls of the Karthus Catacombs? It's found everywhere in the area, but is so faded as to be almost uninterpretable. But if you look closely, you can see a figure, radiating light, bestowing something onto a crowd of reverential onlookers. And there even appears to be an individual among the crowd specifically receiving the bestowal. It's hard to say for certain, but given the proximity to the smoldering lake, which is the site of the old empire of Isolith, and Karthus's obsession with pyromancy, it seems likely that this scene actually shows Quelana bestowing the gift of pyromancy onto mankind, specifically onto her first pupil, Solomon. In other words, this relief commemorates the birth of pyromancy. Just another example of how one ignores the reliefs in these games at one's own peril. Number 6. If you've followed our digs thus far, you know that the beast graves in Elden Ring's Furumazula are heavily inspired by the real-world Varna Necropolis, and its so-called world's oldest gold. But did you know that it's not the first time Miyazaki and company have used Varna as inspiration? Dark Souls 3's High Lord Wolnir is clearly modeled, at least aesthetically, on the most famous burial from Varna, grave number 43. They even have the same orientation, as if the Varna skeleton, like Wolnir from the Abyss, is reaching out at the viewer. I mean, how often do you see a skeleton wearing giant gold bracelets? Number 7. 2009's Demon Souls was the genesis of the Soulsborne formula, and everything from the unique gameplay mechanics and difficulty to the incredible visual detail and borrowing of real-world history was right there from the very start. There are many examples to choose from from Demon's Souls, but we thought we'd highlight one of our favorite visual secrets. In the Unknown Egress, the secret area only accessible by beating the tutorial boss Vanguard, there is a hidden temple, apparently of a deeply old and long forgotten substratum in this world's lore. And consistent with that deep history, the statues lining the area are explicitly old Babylonian most closely resembling the ancient sun god Shamash, though all the gods from this era look pretty similar in human form. Point is, these statues in their original form date to the 2nd millennium BCE. As such, it's one of the oldest IRL references in any of their games, and the developers clearly chose this to evoke an ancient and long-forgotten culture. Number 8. Dark Souls 3's Cathedral of the Deep has many echoes of Catholicism, being a cathedral, seat of archdeacons, in other words, an archdiocese. The cathedral we see today comes from more modest beginnings, built around a temple worshipping the deep. While there are many IRL inspirations relating to the deep, including Shinto inspirations beautifully laid out by Sinclair lore, it also has inspirations from the early days of Christianity. Before the enforcement of a single church creed, there were many narratives of Christian theology. One of the most renowned comes from a famous theologian in Alexandria called Valentinus, who developed a version of Christianity based on ancient Greek philosophy and teachings of Gnosticism. In Valentinian theology, the supreme being at the beginning of everything is simply called the Deep. Furthermore, the Deep has a female consort whose name is Silence. Number 9. Much can be learned from the etymologies of various proper nouns in these games. 
for example, returning to our old friend Elden Ring, Kaled, which is today a desolate wasteland having suffered the equivalent of a nuclear explosion, is only remembered for the Shattering Battle and the Radon Festival. The name, Kaled, derives from the Gaelic word Kaili, a term for a traditional social gathering, presumably in this case referring to the festival itself. Laindell derives from the old British word lay, meaning unseated or untilled, and dale, meaning grove. Laylands, in Britain, were the pieces of land between farmland that were wilder patches of woods, often associated with sacred groves. Raya Lucaria is a Latin term, as are most of the names associated with the culture of the astrologers. For example, Noxtella is Latin for night star. The term Raya Lucaria derives from the Latin word lucus, meaning sacred grove. The Lucaria were organized festivities of the early Roman religion, thought to combine celebration with communal grove clearing for reclaiming more arable land. Raya has many meanings in different languages, but if we stick to the Latin etymology, it relates to radiance. So then, Raya Lucaria would be radiant sacred grove. As you can see, these names fit quite nicely with what we know of these places in game, and even offer glimpses at unseen history. For example, Lane Dell being the unseated or untilled grove as the seat of the Erd Tree. Number 10. And finally, we can apply the same methodology to learn about proper nouns in Dark Souls. For example, the royal family and pantheon of Dark Souls Way of Light, the Gwyns, are actually the Whites. In Welsh, Gwyn is Mr. White. His daughter, Guinevere, is White Bright, and his imperfect high priest and uncle, Lloyd, is Mr. Grey. Interestingly, his son and successor, Gwendolyn, is Successor White. This has echoes of what Susan Wise Bauer points out about Sargon, whose name Sharukinu literally means Rightful King, a dead giveaway that he was probably not the Rightful King. A deep dive into Dark Souls' political history is something we hope to offer in 2023. Thanks for joining us for this holiday special. We wish you all the best in 2023, and we will see you soon for more Elden Ring Archaeology.